Welcome back for the second time. <laughs> so, um, topic today, brachial plexus. Um, I know it might a little bit be confusing to focus and get oriented on all the structures of the axilla. But um, today I will walk you through the structures bit by bit and go always back to the landmarks, how you can refine yourself where you are, just in case at some point you get lost throughout the anatomical observations. The brachial plexus origin from the anterior rami, which emerge from the segment C5 to T1. But um, where is actually C5 to T1? So if we focus on our cervical spine and looking at just the bones, I'm rotating it around. And you remember how we can identify our C7? We start going downwards and the most prominent spinous process, this one here belongs to C7. So we know that this is our seventh cervical vertebra. We know that brachial plexus emerges from C5. So how can we identify C5? So we just count upwards. C7, C6, and C5. And superior to the C5 cervical vertebra, there from the intervertebral foramen, our C5 root emerges. And then it, it's always in the cervical spine above the respective vertebral body. C5 is above C5, C6 root is above C6 root. Then we have C7, which is above C7, which is here. If we could zoom in a little bit. There we have C7. Then we have C8, which is below C7. And then we have T1. And T1 belongs to the thoracic vertebra. And that means it's below T1 thoracic vertebra. So our T1 anterior rami emerges below the first thoracic vertebra, which is here. Our C8 emerges above our first thoracic vertebra. Now the five anterior rami, C5 to T1, emerge like this. And from the, fir from the three, from the five that emerge, they end up into just three. And these three are called the trunks. In terms of their location, superior, middle, and inferior, kind of craniocaudal orientation. Then they undergo into divisions with anterior and posterior divisions, and then they position themselves around the axillary artery. Do you remember the name subclavian changes to axillary after they pass lateral to the first rib? So that means from this position here, we have the axillary artery, and then our divisions group around and position themselves around our axillary artery. And when they are located around our axillary artery, then they're called cords. And how can you best name these cords? Well, if they're located medially, it's the medial cord. If they're located laterally, it's a lateral cord. And if they're located posteriorly, then it's the posterior cord. And after this arrangement, the nerve fibers continue and they form the terminal nerves, which we're gonna cover in detail during the demonstration. Of other importance, bony features in this demonstration is of course the clavicle, the acromion process and the coracoid process. From the coracoid process, you can memorize that three muscles attach to this process. The three muscles are pectoralis minor, the short head of biceps brachii and coracobrachialis. You will need these muscles to orient yourselves how to best identify the respective structures within the axilla and to determine which nerve is which. Now, if we go to our female body donor from which we are very thankful to learn from, 
you can see here the left shoulder and here is the right shoulder. I removed the skin and subcutaneous tissue already from the left anterior thoracic wall and I can expose the pectoralis major muscle. I'm reflecting pectoralis major muscle and I'm also reflecting pectoralis minor muscle. And if we now zoom in, I'm still holding my hand on pectoralis minor muscle. All of these stringy like structures here, all of them here, this is all axillary artery and brachial plexus. But how can we identify? How can we know what is what? So for this, we go into our arm and here we are, can identify the most anterior and superficial muscle. This one here is our base biceps brachii muscle, which is here, which has a long head and a short head. And if we moving this muscle a little bit laterally, we can appreciate another muscle, which is located here. This muscle here. This muscle connects the coracoid process to the humerus and it's called coracobrachialis muscle. And this muscle is pierced by a nerve which we call the musculocutaneous nerve. Here you can see how this nerve enters the muscle and here you can see how this nerve here exits the muscle. The musculocutaneous nerve then travels distally in the arm between the brachialis muscle, which we have here, and biceps brachii, and then emerges on the lateral aspect, which you can see here, and continues as the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm towards the lateral aspect of the forearm, which we have here. You can, you can just follow my fingers, and this is all the pathway of the nerve, which comes here, travels deep to biceps, emerges on the underside of the biceps, pierces coracobrachialis muscle, and then goes back. Now, this nerve, musculocutaneous, we know emerges from the lateral cord. And if we trace him even further, I can move my lateral cord and I can move this location here. And this location, you see it's located lateral to my axillary artery here. See? Lateral cord, axillary artery. If you're still unsure that this is your lateral cord, you can remember from yesterday's session that the lateral pectoral nerve provides motor innovation also to the pectoralis major muscle. So we have our pec major muscle, trace the nerve back, which is the lateral pectoral nerve, and brings us again to the lateral cord, which is the same cord that gives off musculocutaneous. And then we follow the course of the musculocutaneous nerve back, and we see here a cross section. Here, another branch goes off. We follow that branch, and that branch brings us to this nerve here. This nerve, this nerve is a little bit larger than our musculocutaneous, and this nerve lies in the middle. In the middle, when we follow him on the medial aspect of our arm and in the middle of our cubital fossa, and then later on between our flexors and through the carpal tunnel. This is our median nerve. If we go back, see this nerve lies always between some structures, we follow them through the cubital fossa on the medial aspect of our arm, and we can see his connection through the musculocutaneous. So this is my musculocutaneous, this is my median nerve. 
So I have identified now my median nerve and I'm going back again proximally. And I see that I end up being medial to my axillary artery. If I'm putting my axillary artery laterally like this, I'm stabilizing it with my forceps. My lateral thoracic artery, I'm just putting in the side. And then again here, I can see my medial cord. So I'm elevating my medial cord for you with my scissors. And you can see my connection to the median nerve, which is here. I'm going back to my medial cord and from my medial cord, I can see another nerve traveling distally, which is this nerve here. So do you really believe me? It's kind of really like that. Median nerve going back to the medial cord and then starting again to go distally. I'm going distally and I'm going on the lateral and posterior aspect of my elbow joint towards my olecranon. And I know that this here is my ulnar nerve, which then later on I can trace on the ulnar side of my forearm here, how it enters on the ulnar side into my hand. So in this way, I already identified three major nerves of my brachial plexus. And we're going back, follow the ulnar nerve here. And now let's look a little bit at the arrangement. I'm having here my ulnar nerve and my musculocutaneous and my median nerve. They form an M going up here, up here, up here and down here. An M like Mayo Clinic. You can see that here. This is the M. Musculocutaneous lateral cord. Median nerve, medial cord. And then in the ulnar nerve. Also from the medial cord, we have this nerve emerging, which provides sensory innovation to the arm which is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, which is this portion here, and then continues as a very long stringy like structure towards the forearm, which is then called the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which we have here. Now we're going back and we are still missing our posterior cord. In terms of where is this posterior cord? For our orientation, and again, if you got lost, if you zoom a little bit out, sternocleidomastoideus muscle. Here we have the subclavius muscle. Here we have the subclavian vein. Later on, of course, axillary vein. And then here we have the subclavian artery, which later changes the name towards axillary artery, which we have here. So identified medial cord, lateral cord, and then we have here our posterior cord, which is right here. This is our posterior cord. We know the posterior cord gives off two major branches. How can we identify these two major branches? So these two major branches, we know from the lecture, these are our axillary nerve and our radial nerve. So we can best memorize these two nerves by the following arrangement. So we have two muscles, which at some point connect to our humerus, like this. The first muscle belongs to the four muscles of the rotator cuff, which is the subscapularis. The second one is a fairly large muscle, which is located here, which is the latissimus dorsi which is this one. So two muscles that attach to the humerus. The arrangement of 
the two nerves and how we can best identify the two nerves is that the nerve travels on top and anterior to both of the muscles and then loops around and dives deep down accompanied by an artery. In the upper aspect around the subscapularis, the axillary nerve dives deep down and disappears with the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Kind of diving deep down. And for the latissimus dorsi, the radial nerve travels distally accompanied by the profunda brachia artery and dives deep down. So this is the arrangement that we're looking for. This is the theory. And now let's look how it, it's been presented to us here. If I'm opening and I'm putting away my musculocutaneous nerve, you can appreciate this arrangement here. Here we have a nerve, here we have an artery, and both dive posteriorly. We know from the last transmission that this tiny vessel here, this is our anterior circumflex humeral artery. I'm putting that out of the way. And this leaves the posterior circumflex humeral artery, which is accompanied by the axillary nerve. And deep down here, we have our subscapularis muscle. See, this is exactly the arrangement that we identified first in theory. Muscle, nerve and the artery diving deep down. The axillary nerve provides sensory innovation to the shoulder area here, and also motor innovation to our deltoideus muscle, which we have here. From our anatomical concepts, we know that it would make sense to have the neurovascular bundle deep to the respective muscle where the motor innovation is needed. So let's see if this holds true here as well. I'm opening my deltoid muscle and look what we have here in the depth. Here we have the branches of the axillary nerve, how they penetrate into the muscle and a little bit deeper here, down there here, we have the vessels. Here we have even more vessels in this location here, which are the arteries. Here also we have, oh, that looks like a vein to me because it's very wispy and tiny, looks more like a vein. But here you can see how these structures pass through the quadrangular space and reach the deltoideus muscle. Now let's look at the next arrangement where we also have a muscle and the nerve traveling deep to that. So we can identify our latissimus dorsi. I think that's a good landmark. And then we can see here, if I'm putting laterally my brachial artery, a nerve and a artery that travel and looping around and escaping into the depth. You can see them right here. You can appreciate them on this aspect and I'm putting just my forceps through that area and we covered that during the last session because the radial nerve accompanied by the profunda brachia artery came are visible in the triangular interval but this is visible from the posterior aspect. You can imagine that this is not really doable from this view because now we are anteriorly. But if we go a little bit outside, you can see that my forceps is visible on the other side here as well. There you go. So I'm just putting them through that respective location. Okay. And now we have identified most of the respective nerves that belong to the brachial plexus. However, one thing that I would like to show you as well is what, how it looks like a little bit more proximal. So when we look more proximally here in this area, we can see our suprascapular artery. And I know we had this question in one of the earlier sessions about the transverse cervical artery. This is this artery here. The last, when I was asked the, the question about the transverse cervical, I could not answer it because the view is better from anterior. Like I cannot show you properly now the triangular interval, 
but now I can show you the transverse cervical, which you can see here. And if you go even more proximally, you can see our three cords, superior cord, middle cord, and in the inferior cord. If we would dissect now even more medially, and you cannot see that from your angle, if we would dissect now even more medially, we would appreciate the respective, the respective uh, nerve roots, to say better, the anterior rami, how they emerge from their respective intervertebral foramen. One of the structures that is important to appreciate is the relationship where actually is our T1 root. And this T1 root actually is important because sometimes we have anatomical variations which are rare, like pre and post fixed brachial plexus, which are important to know as a surgeon, despite clinically rare, but of those important is of greatest the T1 root because the T1, as the name says, is coming from the thorax. And I will show you where this relationship is. I will reflect on my other side, skin, subcutaneous fat. I'll remove the anterior thoracic wall. And now if we move in, we can see for the overview, here is my chin, here, here is my neck, Here's my manubrium, and I'm diving now into the right thoracic cavity. And I will keep this plane here for you that you see this relationship. We, I showed you the last time here, the intercostal brachial. And this one here, this structure here, this one, this is your T1 component of your brachial plexus. As you can imagine, this is inside your thorax. If you have any structural disease affecting the integrity of your apex of the lungs here, like a thoracic outlet syndrome, this root here can be affected. And the reason is because it's located deep in the apex of our right thoracic cavity. We also have this, of course, of also on the left side, but this is one of the components that you need to understand how close this relationship is from the brachial plexus and from the neck into the thoracic cavity. If you go now back into the overview, I would like that you appreciate one of the important aspects, how you can identify the brachial plexus as well because it's always nice to see all these diagrams in the books, like how they're nicely shown and with different colors, but in reality, they look a little bit different. I would like you to appreciate this, how they look in reality how, and how they loop around our axillary artery. So I'm reflecting my clavicle, which is still attached to the sternocleidomastoideus muscle. And I'm reflecting pectoralis major and minor. And this is my axilla here. And one of the aspects that I would like to show you is now if we make a flight together and on top of our subclavian artery. So for your orientation, here we have our manubrium. This is our first rib here. And this here, if we go this way, we have our axillary vein. Here we have the axillary artery. And you see how it's enveloped and looped around here by the nerves of the brachial plexus. And now we're traveling cranially and proximally along and back into the neck. And this view here is very important because you can see a muscle, which is this one here, this muscle is your anterior scalene muscle. We know that this is anterior scalene because inserts, he inserts and attaches to the first rib. You can appreciate that here. Anterior scalene here, attachment to the first rib. 
And we know that anterior to the anterior scalene, there we have our subclavian vein. I'm reflecting the subclavian vein, and you can expose and appreciate the anterior scalene even better. On top of the anterior scalene, we have a nerve, which we call the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve origins from the segments C3, C4, and C5, and a good mnemonic of that one is C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. So this is our phrenic. Anterior scalene, and posterior to the anterior scalene, we have the interscalene gap or the descalene interval. Here we have our subclavian artery, and cranial to the subclavian artery, we have our trunks. We have here, here, and higher up here. And they are located anteriorly to the middle scalene, which we have here. Posterior to the middle scalene, we have the posterior scalene, which we have here. So anterior, middle, posterior scalene. Between the anterior and the middle, we have the trunks, the three, and the subclavian artery. And anterior to anterior scalene, here, we do have our subclavian vein. I think now you could appreciate the relationships and how it clearly really looks like, that it's not always like a diagram, that sometimes it's a little bit more complicated, but with proper landmarks and with proper overview, you can orient yourself very well and can identify which nerve is what and which nerve belongs to her. And I think this will give you a very nice clinical overview of the brachial plexus. And um, this concludes today's demonstration. And now I would be very happy to answer your questions, which you can please post into the Q&A segment. Ah, Dr. Latchman, welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you, great presentation. <laughs> thank you so much. So if the camera would switch over a little bit. There we go. Wonderful. So team, now it's the time on you to ask us questions. Please post them in the Q&A session. Yes, excellent. Yes, checking feed, the feed works. So in, I do understand that uh, this, uh, this brachial flex is always a little bit tricky, but what would you tell the students? How should they best orient themselves? Because it's, it looks really like a lot of white strings. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, for me, Dr. Kodafana, the easiest way to understand the um, brachial plexus is to look at it from the pictures of an actual dissection and, again, review the videos that you have here as well as come in and take a look at the dissection on their own. I have, me personally, have not found a lot of the diagrams and, and trying to draw out the brachial plexus multiple times very helpful. But for some people, a conceptual map might be helpful mm -hmm. for them as well. I know I that there are also lots of tricks where, you know, you can use um, uh, wires and um, uh, pipe wires and things like yeah. that. I've tried it myself. It didn't work. Not to say that it can't work for some people, but I do think this is the best place to start if you wanted to look at the mm -hmm. brachial plexus and understand. I think relations are important. I agree. Like you pointed out, I think understanding where it comes out from the interscalene um, uh, triangle. I think knowing the muscle relationships are important. And I think it's really critical. The one thing that made a lot of sense to me is when I finally understood that the nomenclature associated with the brachial plexus was in relation to the axillary artery. And the minute you see that and then try to put in the pieces that you've just described, like mm -hmm. let's look at where the medial and lateral pectoral nerves are coming from. These are little clues that actually enable you to reinforce your understanding of the brachial plexus. I think that makes totally sense, yes. Yes. And, oh, look at that. We have already some questions. Are we able to see the anterior posterior divisions of the trunks before the cords of the brachial plexus? Yes. Yes, that's a very good question. And let's go into the overview. And the important thing 
that um, I would like to show, we need to change a little bit the perspective because now we need to have a view from coming from here. Okay. We need to have a view coming like from this location here. So if I'm elevating here my cord, my lateral cord and my axillary artery and my medial cord as well, and if we look down here a little bit in this location here, can I help? Mm -hmm. here you can see that some components dive deep down and some components go up. You can see this one here mm -hmm. goes down, see, it goes this direction, whereas this one goes this direction. Unfortunately, the omohyoid is in your way. Likewise, is the suprascapular artery. But I think you can appreciate that this component here goes a little bit cranially here, whereas this other in the back, it goes a little bit downwards. And these are our anterior and posterior divisions. Anterior and posterior divisions just indicate that from the plane of the scalene, which we have here, it's one single plane, they need to loop around and take their positions in relation to the axillary artery. Mm -hmm. And when they change that single plane that we have here, then they need to go up and go down. And these are called the anterior and posterior divisions. I hope that made sense. It's okay. a little bit tricky to see, but I think that was a very good very demonstration. Good. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next question. Can you identify the long thoracic nerve in relation to the brachial plexus piece? Yes, this is a very good component and very good question. If we would have the overview and a close up a little bit, that would be amazing. From the lateral aspect, which is here, we do have this nerve here. This is our long thoracic nerve. And if we look now from inferior cranially, I can trace my long thoracic nerve. You can see how it travels medially. Mm -hmm. And when he travels medially, he also goes proximally and travels along the brachial plexus. So now let me do a little bit of dissecting for you so you can better see that nerve. So I'm cutting through connective tissue here. I'm reverse scissoring here a little bit. And you can see the nerve here. I still need to reverse scissor. You can see the nerve here. And if we go here even more proximally, we can see how it emerges from the trunk here, from the inferior trunk. You can see that here. So this is the long thoracic, and you just need to trace him back. And the only possible location where this guy can emerge from is proximal to the cords because the cords are in this location, proximal to the divisions, and what is proximal to divisions between the vertebral column, that's the trunks. And this way we know that the long thoracic is a direct branch from the trunks. Let's go to the next questions. Can we see the th three subscapular nerves on the posterior cord. So these, these nerves are a little bit difficult to show. However, we do have a subscapular nerve, which I can show you and trace you on a way backwards, because on a way backwards, you know, we have the scapular notch, then we have the transverse scapular ligament. So if this is my scapular notch, we have the transverse scapular ligament, and then the nerve passes deep to the transverse scapular ligament right here, whereas the artery passes above. It's like, remember, army over navy, A, N, army over navy, mm -hmm. artery, cranial to the nerve. So for this, we need to go into a little bit of a close-up. So one structure that you can identify here is the omohyoid muscle. It really looks muscular. 
and it's actually the only structure that travels from here over and superficial to all of the other structures in the deep neck and that it's still a muscle. And then we have our suprascapular artery here. And then we have here the respective nerve. And you see how close they travel together. There's a string here. Tagging. And here you can see the nerve. And here you can see the artery. Army over navy. You can see them here. I hope that answers your questions. In case some of the nerves were not closely depicted here, mm -hmm. you are always able to come in the afternoon and our TAs will be most happy to show you these structures in their, in their dissected bodies. And then you can even get a closer look and a better close up um, than you can have it here from our camera transmissions. Mm -hmm. Let's switch to the next question. Would you please show us the branches of the brachial plexus, such as the subclavian nerve? I suppose oh, they're talking about the nerve to uh, subclavius, I think, which yes. is a very small nerve that supplies subclavius under the clavicle. I do you think we even preserve that branch? No, I can tell you that uh, yeah. I during the, the dissections, this is one of the branches that is very small. And at some point it needs to go because if I want to reflect the subclavius muscle, which you can yeah. see here, the nerve cannot stay attached. Just imagine yeah. if I would have this muscle over here, you would not be able to see any subclavian artery or subclavian vein. Yeah, and, and it's actually a pretty small branch as well. So I wouldn't, um, unless we do a very special dissection to show this yeah. nerve to subclavius. Let's switch to um, the next um, question. Would you mind showing the branches of the axillary artery? And if possible, the division of the toracromial artery? Yes, we can do that. So we will zoom in and we see here our subclavian artery. Then it changes the names to axillary artery. And we know the thoracochromial trunk or artery emerges in a second segment, which when we put back the pectoralis minor, which should identify here. And exactly in this location here, I see this artery, which emerges as a direct branch of the axillary artery giving off this branch and this branch. And if we trace this branch, we can see how a little branch continues towards the acromion, which is here. Mm -hmm. And because I identified all of these branches here, I can tell that this here is our toracoacromial trunk or artery. Mm -hmm. And even, I mean, you might get confused when you just look at all of these branches here, say, oh my goodness, they just look like strings. But just try to see where they're going to. Mm -hmm. Just try to see where they go and what the branching pattern is. And then you identify the structures and just trace them back. And then you can name them. Mm -hmm. Because just imagine if you would look through the opening of my scissors here, if you would just look through that opening, you don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. So for this, it's always important to have an overview, to see where they're going to, and then you can orient yourselves and you can name them accordingly. I think also what students should focus on is identifying the thoracochromial trunk or the artery. The branches are variable. Like any time you have a trunk, there's going to be multiple branches. And, and being focused on identifying each of those branches, sometimes, you know, the variability plays in. So for mm -hmm. me, I would focus on knowing where the thoracochromial trunk is and understanding that it has a chromial branch, a clavicular branch, pectoral branch, deltoid branch. Okay. I agree. The, the branches of the thoracoacromial um, trunk are very variable. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the features that we need to understand. Some arteries are much more constant, like the subclavian artery. Yep. But the smaller the branches they get, the more variable Exactly. There There's a lot of variability. Let's switch to the next question. Can you explain why the axillary nerve is C5, C6, even though it's coming from the posterior cord supplied by C5 to T1? This is an excellent question. So um, when, when you think that we have a lot of interchangeable connections mm -hmm. within the brachial plexus, we have 
the five segments of the C5 to T1 and they mix with each other during the divisions. They mix with each other during the divisions and later on, they also mix within the cords. So that means you have two possibilities where you can mix the fibers and these mixing. This is a tool of mother nature to preserve motor and sensory innovation of our arm because it could be that it receives any lesions or any trauma, but you still want to be able to move and feel your arm. In terms of when you think back of embryology mm -hmm. and you would extend segment by segment this way, you can really count them down, starting from top, going downwards, downwards, and downwards. And then if you look at the sensory innovation, which always gives you an indication how the previous embryonic segments were located, you can always identify where is what. So for instance, if the camera would focus on myself, so if I'm doing like this, you can just count from top, starting from C5, C6, C7, C8, T1, and you go this way down. And if you think that radial nerve has segments C5 and C6, which means I'm coming from top, here in this location here, mm -hmm. exactly here, here is my sensory innovation area of my radial nerve because radial nerve does sensory this component here. So in this way, you can always trace it back, but it has something to do with embryology and the mixing that we have here is just to protect the upper extremity in motor and sensory ways. Yes. This is a tool of what Mother Nature gave to us. Yes. And I think that kind of information would be further um, reinforced if you look at dermatomal distribution. Yes, exactly. So dermatomes, myotomes, you can read about that a little bit extra information. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's also very useful. I know with PMNR uh, physicians, they use this for EMG studies and to also understand which spinal cord segments are implicated when the person is presenting with any uh, symptoms. Mm -hmm. So this becomes important. It's an important discussion to understand these. And usually there's a dominating spinal cord segment associated with any of those nerves. Mm -hmm. So in your textbook, when you see it, sometimes you'll see maybe uh, C8 is bigger than the rest of the C segments. Mm -hmm. So know that that's the predominant segmental supply to that nerve. Exactly. So from, from last day, we saw that um, with continuing the session until 11, you might not have enough break and recreational time for your next session for the mm -hmm. ARS, which actually starts at 11. And this way we will finish these sessions a little bit earlier so that you have a mental break because mm -hmm. it's so, I mean, you have to be all the time in front of the screen. And this is why we'll take now just one last um, question. Dr. Kodafana, yes. one of the other questions that the yes. students asked was to show the upper and lower subscapular nerve, but we also pointed out the suprascapular nerve. So from this dissection approach, are we able to visualize the subscapular nerves? No, we can't. Right. Because, because during the dissection, for this, um, we just need to, if we take away the scapula as a whole yes. and disarticulate all of these structures, then we might be able to see some of the deeper points. Yes. So it is limited by the dissection approaches that we use. Yes. Yes. So in this way, we would say we take just a last question. Mm -hmm. And that is, what is the relation of the parts of the brachial plexus to pectoralis minor muscle? So if I'm putting back my pectoralis minor muscle, you can understand that most of the components of the brachial plexus are deep to pectoralis minor. Pectoralis minor, brachial plexus, and the axillary artery. So that would be the answer would be deep. Mm -hmm. So in this way, if you still have questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. We will be today in the afternoon in the lab dissecting. You can see when you are around, we are also around. We can always help you out. And uh, you can watch us even dissecting other areas. We can talk about certain concepts. Please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you're not in lab, please feel free to send us emails. We're most happy to answer your questions. Or anything. And in this way, we would like to end today's session. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.